Welcome to World History. Today we looked at the effect of European trade and encroachment on the Indian subcontinent of South Asia. Today we're going to be examining the effect on China and we're going to return to our old friends the Qing dynasty to see how they fare in this world where Europeans are now traveling around looking for both sources of raw materials and, uh, and new markets for their trade goods. So we're going to look at the reasons why the Qing dynasty declines, uh, spoiler alert. We're going to analyze the strategy of Lin Zhezhu to deal with uh, British opium and look at the effects of the Treaty of Nanjing on the Chinese relationship with the West. So let's begin our story. As you hopefully remember, the Qing dynasty was the, um, the last imperial dynasty of China, ruled by, of course, a Manchurian elite who had conquered uh, the Han Chinese and forced them to adopt a lot of their customs. But as far as relationships with the West goes, the Qing dynasty was even more uh, limited than what we saw in uh, than what we saw during the Ming dynasty. They still had all the trade goods that the West wanted, specifically, you know, silk, porcelain, and especially tea. But they had limited. Uh, they really were worried about Western influences, and so the Qing the uh, Qing emperors put harsh restrictions on foreign traders. You'd have to show up and kowtow before the emperor, which led to some pretty significant. Or actually, I mean, if you're a foreign trader, quite frankly, you're kowtowing before some imperial official, you know, to show your the subservience of your government. And of course, as we as we talked about before, the Canton system limited all European trade to the uh, one city of Guangzhou, and in fact, just one district within the city of Guangzhou where all foreign uh, all foreign trade had to happen. Plus, we hopefully remember the British, uh, the British ambassador Lord McCartney, offended the Qing emperor by not kowtowing effectively, and so the British had somewhat been, had been temporarily banned from Chinese trade. This, this system started to sort of fall apart in the later years of the Qinlong Emperor's rule. As we remember, he got much less sort of, he got, he, the Qing Emperor became much less vigorous. He spent much more time, you know, eating and relaxing and hanging out with his best friend, uh, He Shen. And so uh, trade policies sort of took, uh, took a back seat to other concerns. And so pirates started to uh, attack these valuable tra uh, trade routes. Most famously, uh, Qing Shi was able to uh, build this massive pirate fleet, the Red Flag Fleet, and uh, terrorize the whole coast of southern China, leading to uh, some significant disruptions in trade. And so the Portuguese came to an agreement with the Qinlong Emperor that if they dealt with the dread pirate Qing Shi, then they could get uh, primary or uh, special trade privileges. Namely, the, ex the port city of Macau fell under Portuguese rule. Well, the British, once they saw this, they desperately wanted a port city of their own. And so famously, uh, King George wrote to the Qinlong Emperor asking for similar considerations, and the Qinlong Emperor utterly refused, leading to some significant, leading to the British to start looking for other ways to potentially break into the Chinese market. What they discovered was if they, if they sell addictive drugs and get lots of Chinese people addicted to them, specifically opium, then they would always have a, a ready supply of uh, customers. And so thus begins the British opium trade. England began uh, encouraging people in uh, India to grow opium, which they then shipped to China in exchange for tea. Obviously, this is an awesome deal for the British because uh, dealing drugs is super lucrative, but it's a really problematic for the Chinese who, one, are now dealing with this massive opium problem, and two, are now getting a whole bunch of citizens who are willing to go around the trade restrictions in order to get access to this opium, which they're now addicted to. And so the emperor of China at the time uh, sends a commissioner named Lin Zhezhu to go deal with this opium problem, and Lin comes up with a three-step plan. One, of course, uh, ban all the opium and arrest all the opium dealers. Two, take every Chinese person who's addicted to opium and put them in these safe houses to dry out. And three, destroy all the opium in Canton. And so Lin Zhezhu goes about seizing and destroying all the opium in Canton. The problem, of course, is most of this opium is owned by the British. And so he ends up destroying somewhere around a billion dollars worth of opium which makes the British government somewhat angry. And so they start uh, asking for restitution. Obviously, uh, obviously, 
the Chinese government is not going to do this. Lindsay Zhu points out to uh, Queen Victoria at this point that uh, the you know opium is illegal in England. And so what the heck are you even doing selling it here? But the British have now, of course, uh, gone through the Industrial Revolution, have advanced gunships and a much more modernized army. And in the Opium Wars, they utterly crush the Chinese, first going up the Pearl River and uh, taking out uh, some Chinese uh, settlements and destroying the Chinese Navy. Then they also go uh, through the Yangtze River Delta and capital, capture the capital of Nanjing, famously destroying the Southern Imperial Palace in the process. We see the, the ruins of the Summer Palace down here. And as an end result of this, the Guangdong Emperor is forced to sign the Treaty of Nanjing. This is an incredibly humiliating treaty where England gets their own island citadel, Hong Kong. They get the right to trade in a bunch of Chinese, major Chinese cities. They get what's called extraterritoriality, which means British people don't have to follow Chinese laws like the ban on opium, which de facto makes opium legal in China. China out of this gets the privilege of not having their cities bombarded by the British anymore, which I guess good. But man, this kicks off what's known as the century of humiliation for China. And so uh, that tells you how this is going to go in the future. Here are a bunch of the cities. Uh, then there's a second opium war over the seizure of a British ship. Uh, basically, England's looking for more or less any pretense to, uh, again, destroy a significant portion of Chinese cities and, get, and renegotiate the unequal treaty of Nanjing. And so this leads to an era of spheres of influence, where every other European country now finds a, a reason to go to war against China, and they get their own sphere of influence in which they control, their laws are supreme, and they get a monopoly on trade with China. So metaphorically, although, although the Qing government is still ostensibly in control, European powers and one Asian power, which we'll talk about uh, in a couple days, begin to carve up China and uh, exploit them. Then probably one of the worst things happens. A, guy, uh, a Scotsman named Robert Fortune ends up, uh, ends up sneaking into China and stealing the secret of tea. Tea is, of course, a plant that grows all over the place. But the, t the specific technique for uh, processing and drying tea in order to make it into the delicious beverage that we know and love today it was unique to China. It was just a closely held secret, and uh, it was a capital crime to, um, to try to steal this secret of tea. But Robert Fortune is able to sneak in and steal Chinese tea plants and observe the Chinese tea production process. And so he then starts introducing tea into India and Indonesia and places like that. And before you know it, the Chinese monopoly on tea disappears and tea is grown all sorts of places, which is great if you like tea. It's really bad for China, of course, because it's going to significantly cut down on the value of their exports. So hopefully you can answer these questions in some detail. And when we come back, obviously China is not happy about any of this. So we'll look at the ways that China responded to all these insults in our next lecture.